My name is Maddie Duncan. My YouTube channel is Maddie Duncan. My Instagram is Maddie Duncan. You know where to find me. This week on the Punks on Pizza podcast, we're sitting with a multi talented, multi instrumentalist, Maddie Duncan, who recently released her debut album, Myopia and Dystopian Utopia, which you can found on all the usual streaming services, Spotify, and Apple Music, and the like. Which, by the way, is the album title. Is a really clever, worthy bit of a I'm quite Yeah, I, I liked it because I could have three title tracks that way. I originally just started with myopia, and then I was like, I'm going to add these words. It just worked out. Yeah, it did work out. I, I, well, every time I said it, I'm just like, I wish tapioca was in there. Tapioca, okay. The new thing that was it's close enough to it. Yeah, that's delicious texture. Right? Uh, but before we get to the album, I just wonder if you could tell me about when you first picked up an instrument and which instrument that was. Okay, um, so I always like talking about the reason why I became a musician because it's kind of ridiculous. Um, so when I was probably like 10 years old, I had very scraggly blonde hair and I wore these like thick glasses. Uh, and someone told me I looked like Garth from Wayne's World, and I didn't know what that was. Party was on. 10, yeah, party on. Um, so I found the movie and I watched it, and then I just, like, as a 10-year-old, I thought they were, like, the coolest people ever, and I was like, man, I gotta be like Garth. So I wanted to become a drummer, um, and thankfully my uncle is a drummer, so he lent me a drum kit, and that's where I started, because I wanted to be like Garth. Oh, and, and now you're looking for a drummer. Now I'm looking for a drummer, please, <laughs> anyone. <laughs> How the world turns. Yeah. Yeah, because when I was doing a quick browse uh, through the old face space there, I saw you play a uke, a drum kit, guitar, and keys, and uh, in what appeared to be a few different bands. Yeah. And I was wondering what the bands were before I ended up. Okay, so my first band was called Torrance. Um, I knew that. Oh, you knew that! Wow, look at you, the <laughs> Nardwar of Port Alberni. Uh, I knew that. Oh, you knew that! Wow, look at you, the <laughs> Nardwar of Port Alberni. Um, yeah, that was in high school. I think I was thirteen. It was me and two of my friends. I played drums and sang, which was <laughs> testing <laughs> my limits. Um, <laughs> then after that, I was in a band called Stranger Than Fiction throughout high school. Um, I still play with some of those guys now. Uh, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, fuck. <laughs> I don't know what that was. But I it sounded it was. like something at the dentist almost. Uh, what's the worst thing I could have said? Come on. So then, Stranger Than Fiction, we kind of dissipated, and I started just to work on my own music, which. I never really wanted to play live as just Maddie Duncan because I feel like that's more of like a oh it's too much about me. So I wanted to have like a band name as well. And Amateur Hour, I just thought was hilarious because the guys that I play with are so like incredibly talented. Like I feel a bit like an amateur, but I just thought it was funny. Uh, was there an abbreviation A R T C? Oh yeah, that was um, that was when I was. Just after Torrance, I was in a, there was a, a thing in town for kids who played music called Alberta Teen Flora, uh, which helped us get some shows and get bands playing. It was nice. Yeah. Shout out to Todd Flora. Helped a lot. When uh, you like arrange for like a child event, so yeah. what have you? Yeah. yeah. When you first saw it, put together the amateur hour, did you kind of select bandmates who already worked with uh, there, or how did you how did you find them? Um, they were all guys that I had been in with Stranger Than Fiction. Yes, that was how I found them because I already knew them, and they were still in town or in the and I was like, okay, do you guys want to play this music? And they all agreed. And then one of them left, and then another one from the band came back, and now I'm looking for a drum. <laughs> the word is out. Yeah. What, uh, going from Stranger to Fiction, what were the main changes that you wanted to implement, being all the same member 
Marvels, essentially. I know, yeah, that's kind of funny. Um, I think it's just a lot of a different style of music, like we were doing more heavy rock stuff in Stranger Than Fiction, and my music is more synth-based, and also I didn't play any instruments in Stranger Than Fiction, and now I'm playing keyboards and singing, which definitely tests my limits as well. <laughs> That's fair, the multi-instrumentalist gig is, is hard. I feel like I can play takes all right, sing all right, but both of them all yeah. the same step. I can't like put on a good show, play an instrument, and sing. I can do two, but not three of them. Did, so did you take up the roll of keys immediately? Um, the first show we did, I had a different keyboard player, and then he moved away, so I just decided, well, you know, I'll just do it myself. Uh, how hard can it be? Uh, Hard. But I'm still doing it, so that's good. Um, the first show we did, I had a different keyboard player, and then he moved away, so I just decided, well, you know, I'll just do it myself. Uh, how hard can it be? Uh, hard. But I'm still doing it, so that's good. How are you with singing and drumming? You might have better luck finding a keys player. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I was thinking about that. Everyone's like, why don't you just drum for your own band? And I'm like, well, First of all, I don't think I can play the songs that I've written on drums. <laughs> Not some of them. Some of them were way too hard. But Who was the drummer that you played with? This is going off script now. I just made me think of it. At the fair, you had a drummer. That was like going fucking ham back then. Yeah, that was awesome. That was my bassist, Drake. That's one of his friends from school. So he's a jazz drummer. Oh, um, this is really bad for <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm like trying to fish the name out of my head. Drake's buddy. Drake's buddy. <laughs> we had so much fun. Thank you so much. I feel like it's Adam Robertson. Okay. That's yeah. It just came back to me. It's Adam for sure. You say if you guess the last name too, you're probably right. Yeah. yeah. Or a real good bullshitter if you just yeah. split the whole thing, the <laughs> social security number at all. Uh, you said the first show you didn't play keys. Do you remember uh, when there were rehearsals? Was it was there a lot more covers, or was it immediately into what you wanted to do your stuff? Um, yeah, it was started with <laughs> it started with the original songs because I sent them to all my old bandmates, and I, we had a rehearsal without a keyboard the first time, and I tried playing and singing, and I was like, guys, I just can't do this. Uh, so then I messaged another friend and he joined in, but yeah, it was mostly focused on originals from the beginning. Now, you played uh, live for, for years before recording and putting out this album yes. that you just had. Yeah. Were there any, and landing some pretty big gigs too, like I, I saw fairs and lots of <laughs> downtown events yeah. and such. Uh, are there any that stand out to you? Um, I always loved playing the Five Acre Shaker. We got to do that a couple of times with Stranger Than Fiction, and that was great. That was like the biggest stage that we've been on. And we got to open for Set the Whale as well with Stranger Than Fiction, which was the definitely the biggest thing we ever did, and it was very cool. I love those guys. They were so kind. That's cool. I saw, yeah, I saw recently um, Sturdy Lemon's audition tape open for Set oh. Whale, and I was thinking, I'm like, I think Maddie got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we were both in that contest. That's funny. That suck it, Sturdy Lemon. Well, we actually lost, though, so they, oh. they just liked us, so they sent us an email and said, do you want to open for our island shows? Oh, that's awesome. It was almost even better. That's yeah. super cool, yeah. That makes it way more personal. Yeah. In regards to playing live, you use a headset. Yeah, I call it my Britney mic. Your Britney mic? Yeah. Does that come from any experience in theater? Um, I actually did do theater when I was in high school. Uh, I was in Greece and Rock of Ages. But, no, it's... I'm Sandy? No, I auditioned for Sandy. I didn't get the part. I was literally the radio voice. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, no, I use that microphone so I can actually sing into the microphone better and look around at what I'm doing with my hands. Because otherwise, if you just have it in one spot, then I like have, I can't really see what I'm doing with my hands as much, and I make many more mistakes. Um, yeah. It's for efficiency. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, 
you were talking about getting to play on some big stages. Now, I think you said those were the biggest stages you played on, but I thought the biggest stage you played on was the Rogers Arena on September 8th in 2018. Do you recall this? Yes. Yeah. That is definitely the biggest stage that I've performed on by far, but like that was like four minutes. So. I watched the, the video. Um, you you go up and you join the Foo Fighters and duet with Taylor Hawkins on Under Pressure. Was that as random as it appeared in the video? Um yes. And no, because I went into it with a plan, like, okay, I know exactly how I'm going to make this happen. So I, like, waited outside the venue for probably five or six hours, and I met Taylor outside the venue, and I, I put the idea in his head. I'm like, hey, can I sing Under Pressure with you guys? And he said, I don't know. That's kind of Dave's thing. Um, and he was really nice, and I got a picture with him. And then... At the show, it was just about getting to the front so I could hold up my sign and maybe he would remember. And that did happen. So. And that worked? Yeah. That's fucking killer. Yeah. That's a great success story. Yeah. Planning goes a long way. <laughs> and, and persistence, you know? Yeah, persistence. Yeah. I have done plenty of waiting around the backstage doors and touring oh, yeah. buses and all that to myself. It's very cool. Uh, so. Foo Fighters, you've listed um, influences on your website, like, such as Sparks and uh, David Bowie. I was wondering if there were any live shows that you saw in your childhood that inspired kind of your stage presence. Um, hmm. Wow, I got thinking. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think like every live show that I've seen, I've maybe take a little bit of something from, but there wasn't like one where it was like, wow, okay, this changed me. I think it was actually the movie um, Stop Making Sense, the Talking Heads uh, show. Yeah, that one, when I watched it, I, that was like a, okay, my world has completely changed. Wow, yeah. Talking Heads, yeah. and you covered them, right? Yeah, we usually yeah. cover them. Yeah, no, I, I was thinking about that because when I, I was a kid and my mom took me to see Alice Cooper for my oh, first concert yes. and like a, a lot of things are boring after that. Yeah, my first concert was Our Lady Peace and um, halfway through it I just wanted to go home so I don't know what that says. But <laughs> you couldn't find peace? No. <laughs> How old were you then? I think I was nine. It was like one of those free concerts at the PME. Yeah. Oh, okay, all right, all right. I I haven't I haven't been, but my hometown did something similar. I wanted to know a little bit about your writing process. Does it start with lyrics? Does it start on the keys, on a guitar, or does it start for Um, usually I start I just. I start with keys, um, but I usually try and write the melody first, or a chord progression and the melody, because to me the melody is the most important part, whether it's like vocals or like a guitar melody. Um, I'm not much of a guitarist, so I don't really write on guitar, I can chord, but like, I don't find writing easy that way. So it's always keys for me, and I usually never do lyrics first, because I have a hard time like building the rest of the song around lyrics. I did that for one song, Venetian Red, and the original lyrics are so different from the end because it was hard to fit them into the song. It's like really cut down. That's right. You talked about losing some members and gaining some, and now you're... And normally, and I, this is cool, this, this kind of feels like I'm cornering you in this question, which feels a little cool, but I, I'm kind of enjoying it. Every time I ask someone in a band, what they think their most like their strongest lineup has been. Every band goes blow my lineup now. But you're missing a drummer, so you cannot say that. Yeah. <laughs> Throughout the years, when do you think the Maddie Duncan Amtrauer had its strongest lineup of people behind it? Oh wow, this is a mean question. Um, it's also flattering. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I feel like oh. I mean, we've only been doing it as this like iteration of the band for probably two years. Um, we played our first show like two years ago, um, and we. I'm gonna have to say our strongest lineup was with um, 
while well, Phoenix is still on guitar, Drake is still on bass, um, and Noel is a drummer because we did more shows with Noel. I only did one show with Ryan as a drummer. Um, so that's probably our strongest lineup. Yeah. Got to play around more and have more fun with it because we had it for a lot longer. So. That's, that's fair. That's fair. I don't think Avery's feelings are going to be Yeah, I know. I like. I don't really have that much of an opinion on that, so I was trying to find a nice way to just like. The politician's answer. Yeah. The, ace. <laughs> the songs that were on the album, you said this iteration had just been around two years. Uh, were those all these songs on the album, or are you playing them live for the two years before they were recorded? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, some of them, I think the earliest song from the album that I wrote was in 2019. Um, okay. So, yeah, we definitely played the first half of the album live for, since two years ago. Um, yeah, because that's the my live songs, I would call them. The other half's too like mellow to play live, in my opinion. That, that kind of goes into the next question, Well, I was wondering, you talked about the lyrics of Venetian Red yes. changing a lot over the course of recording it. I was wondering, do you find any songs work significantly better live than on the album, and vice versa? Um, yes. I think my first five tracks, I specifically split the album in half. That way I'm like, I want this to be the fun side, and this to be the kind of mellow, sad side. And obviously the fun songs are best live, because people want to have fun at a show, not um, get depressed. So... <laughs> I don't know, I go to Nick Cave every time. I'm okay, there. but There's that's like that. fun depressed, you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah, not bored depressed. That's like you for depressed. I would say the, uh, the opening track and, oh, I don't want to fuck it up, and being alone, except. Another day alone, except. Another day alone, except. That falls into that category, I would say. Okay. Lyrically, yeah. it's it's about some pretty bummer realizations, but it's very fun and poppy with a like great strong vocal. It's not uh, yeah. whiny or depressing musical at all. Yeah, I think that's always a fun thing to do is have like a fun song and then write something that people maybe won't think about, and if they're singing along to it, not that anyone knows all the words to my songs, but. Um, they might have a realization later, like, oh, that's kind of, like, sad. Wow. Because <laughs> I, I was getting, because I remembered hearing it live, but not paying too much attention to the words and listening to it. I was like, oh, that's a huge bummer. Yeah. I, mean, I like that. It's very cool. That's the type of irony that tickles me think. Yeah, wow. <laughs> as far as the, so the slower songs, do you see yourself playing those live eventually, or trying to work in, like, a slower set? Um, yeah, absolutely. It just depends on, like, the kind of show, the venue and stuff. I'd love to do something that showcases, like, all of the songs, but most of the shows that I do, I feel like I have to keep the audience up, you know? So, right now, probably won't play them live. Yeah, I could... I... I was really hoping to uh, hear you scream, kick out the jams, motherfucker, at the county fair. I thought that would have been a very cool... I was waiting for it the Yeah, time. oh, sorry. <laughs> That's like one of our filler songs. We used to do that in Stranger Than Fiction, so all the guys still knew it. Uh, so we're like, alright, we need ten more minutes. Let's spread this one out. I got such a kick out of when you guys played it, because we were talking about... Um... I forget the name of the band. One of the bands that was booked that couldn't show up, their bassist couldn't make it, and mm -hmm. you guys were like, we'll give you our bassist, and they were like, no, no. <laughs> and we were talking about it, and I was like, ah, you know, they should have taken the bassist. Kick out the jams, motherfucker. And you were like, yeah, yeah, and then ended the set with kick out the jams, <laughs> and I was like, oh, no way, that's that's very cool. Can't go wrong with MC5. Yeah, definitely. Now, Talking about MC5, you're obviously a Bowie fan. That might even be an understatement. Uh, where do you stand with Iggy Pop? Because I, I was thinking that was a battle. A battle? Iggy Pop people and David I people. feel like Iggy Pop and David Bowie, for me, it's like like they worked together and made some really incredible things. So it's not a battle. It's like a, they're like intertwined, you know? 
I love them both. That's cool. But I do like Bowie's writing more, personally. Have you seen either of them live? No. No. I guess you won't see Bowie. Not David Bowie, no. no. That would be pretty incredible uh, if he came back from the dead. Well, I'm sure you can go see a hologram. <laughs> yeah. Um, talking about your lack of drummer, which throws a stint in, in things, uh, are there plans as far as touring or playing live this summer at all, or is that all weighing on the drummer? It is weighing on having a drummer. Like, God, there's man. a lot of gigs that I'm looking at, and I'm like, oh, I want to apply for this, I want to arrange this, but I want to have like a solid set like I want the band to be solid and it's kind of hard when you have a sit-in drummer because you don't get to have as many practices and it doesn't feel as melded together you know for sure yeah yeah usually like a, a sit-in drummer can toe the line that doesn't catch the nuance yeah like, that makes sense but, uh, as far as touring goes what's the extent of your touring experience how far have you gone from home okay I have barely done any touring. I would love to tour. I think it would probably make me a little bit insane. I have only done the island. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, it's still pretty big. Yeah, and not extensively the island. <laughs> <laughs> like Victoria, Nanaimo? Um, Camp River. Oh, it's probably okay. the farthest. Yeah. What was that for? That was for one of the Set the Whale shows. <laughs> okay, yeah. alright. Camp River. So recently, um, show me the only strip club on the island out of Campbell River. Oh, wow. They do live music on Thursday nights, oh, and I was God. like, this is the most inspiring film that I <laughs> always wanted to play as a strip That club. would actually be fun. <laughs> Three dancers for your set? Wow. wow. Well, I think you play out on the patio. Oh, damn. I think that's how they, <laughs> they weasel it. So you weren't playing the strip club? No, no, we played at the Tide Mark. Well. It's a beautiful, beautiful pink theater. That leaves room for too many crude jokes. Oh my god. <laughs> what do you think of the current music scene here in Port Alberni? You've been involved with it since your childhood, so you've seen yeah. it go through changes. Where do you think it is in its current day? Um, right now, I think it's a little bit quieter than it used to be. I feel like there used to be quite a lot of actually a metal scene in town, which isn't really here anymore, because I guess those guys grew up and left. Uh, yeah, I don't see as much music in town as I used to, as much as I'd like. You know, I do like um, how there's some more, like Five Acre Shakers putting on events and stuff and Five Acre Productions, but there's not a lot of local bands that get to play there, so yeah. Yeah, you know, it's kind of, it's slim pickings for local bands. That's true, yeah. Like, I, the, when I put on the two house shows just to see like who would show up because I knew nothing about nobody. I was new to town. Everybody was like uh, Maddie Duncan and Sturdy Lemon. Those yeah. are like the two local bands. And you guys were unable to for whatever reason. I can't recall at the time. And Sturdy Lemon, I messed with them and they're like, no, we all moved to Nanaimo. We're in Nanaimo. And like everything's changed. Like we're in Nanaimo bands. And I was like, is that a common thing? Do people disown Port Alberni and move on? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Some of my band lives in Nanaimo, but we're still a Port Alberni based band. You know. You're going to change that as soon as you split? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Sorry, Port Alberni. <laughs> you were good while you lasted. Yeah. Were there any bands that you used to play with, uh, maybe even in, in older bands or in the earlier days that you looked up to and that have since disbanded? Um, wow, that is a question I need to think about. Um, I feel like most of the bands that we played with were all men. So I feel like there wasn't really any role models for me because um, not I've had many like male role models too, but I've never felt like buddies with one of those bands or looked up to them. But yeah, I don't know. No kind of answers, but not really. <laughs> Fair enough. 
enough. Have you been writing any new songs like since the the albums come out? Oh yeah, uh, I mean, even before the album came out, I was working on the next one, which was kind of hard because I'm like, damn, I just gotta get these songs out so I can move on because I'm like tired of this shit. Um, so yeah, definitely working on the second album now, and it's going good. How have rehearsals looked with with no no drummer? <laughs> we haven't been rehearsing. Oh damn! Man. Yeah, it's just what can you do? You don't get together like keys and strings just to hash it out? Uh, no, not right now. I mean, Phoenix and I are working on music, but it's kind of separate from that. Yeah. Is that like another project? Yeah, we're um, gonna release some songs together. It will be interesting because he's coming from more of a hip hop side, and I'm coming from more of a alternative rockish side. Oh, okay, that be more along the lines of what he was doing with Stolen. Yeah. But not, because it's, it's like both of our styles are kind of fighting. We're trying to get them to oh, go together, okay. yeah. How long have you guys been working on that? That sounds like a cool little project. Yeah, um, we've been talking about it for a long time. And just like a couple weeks ago, we finally got together and sat down. It's like, all right, let's actually do this. So, yeah. Oh, see, so you've been stagnant without a drummer and you... you put your productive efforts into something else. Yeah. That's very cool. Very cool. Uh, have you guys, are you at the stage yet to start discussing going live with it or anything along those lines? Um, with the project? Yeah. Uh, no. We is not, is there a name for this project? I think we're actually, project? we're just going to do it like Phoenix Gates and Maddie Duncan. Like, okay. just our names. All right, all right. Like, David Byrne and Brian, you know, you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so with everything up in the air for the Maddie Duncan Amateur Hour, what, uh, where does that leave the rest of the band's mates? Yeah, um, everyone's kind of doing music, like, in different ways. Like, Phoenix does his hip-hop music, Drake is going to school for jazz and he's going to graduate soon and be a teacher. Um, then I'm still doing my music, just writing and trying to record whatever I can do without a drummer. <laughs> well, I feel kind of like desperate in this conversation. I feel like I'm mentioning drummers so many times. I'm just going to come off as a bit. A flash on the screen, drummer needed it. Yeah. <laughs> two minutes through this podcast. Call. Yeah. Number below. We were talking about this a little bit when you first got here. You said you are not much of a drinker. You are not much of a pot person. On the podcast, we try to cover the topics of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I'm not going to dive into the first one with you because it seems kind of skeevy. The last guest on the podcast, we talked about a piss fetish. All right, hold on. Uh, I mean, we already know Mi Mickey's down with the piss. What about you? Yeah. I have a little, a little. I mean. I let I, I did let a do a gay do po me once. <laughs> I was high on meth and it wasn't terrible. We're not oh gonna, gonna go that way <laughs> this okay. time around. But um, as far as drug experiences go, you you said you're pretty straight edge. Were there negative experiences that led you to this? Um, I think it's more of just like. I don't know, watching people around me and like some people, I don't know, <laughs> um, I don't know, anytime I drink I just don't really have fun, I just kind of get depressed and like even if you drink so much it's like oh, I don't know, I never really feel drunk until it's like blackout and then it's like, it's not really any fun, but I don't know, I just, it's just never something I've really been interested in, it's kind of weird, but. It's kind of weird, but... uh, so no room for hallucinogens or anything of the like? No, and I also have like really bad anxiety, so I always have the thoughts like, oh my god, what if I have a really bad trip and then it triggers the schizophrenia gene and then I go schizophrenic. And that's what will do it, the thought alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of how, how that works, yeah. Alright, well, I, I won't... Uh, really, with too many of the, the filthy, upsetting questions, I would uh, be an average guest. But the, the last question to every podcast, I, I still feel obligated 
to inquire about. That's rough because you are a dainty figure, and I imagine it's not something you would not be joyous to discuss, but in all your years of playing, what's the worst venue bathroom experience that oh. you had? Oh my god. Okay, yeah, I actually once, um, for fun, I wrote uh, like a article, I call it an article, it's not published anywhere, on um, rating and reviewing bathrooms that I've had the worst experiences in. Um, so you're a professional so on this I am, topic. I am a professional on this topic. The worst bathroom I've ever been in in general is um, the Disneyland hotel bathroom. You would think it would be nice, but uh, it was not. It was awful, and they have Disney music playing the whole time, so I was like violently ill in the bathroom, and it's like, I let it go, it's playing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was awful. Floor's all wet. I don't know with what. Gross. Worst venue bathroom. Um, Disney World's up there. Yeah, oddly, oddly, like, I'm not having one flash into my mind. I'm just having all of them spinning around in there. You don't need one. If you want to rapid fire a few that you recall, that's allowed. Um, I remember, I can't remember what venue this was, but they had, and most of the things were fine, but they didn't have a working sink. Um, they didn't have like hand sanitizer or anything, so it's just like you use the toilet and you walk out, uh, whatever you got. Um, <laughs> which some people would be like, oh, whatever, I do that anyways. But um, to me, I'm like, oh, that's disgusting. So, yeah. hair dry and carry on. Yeah. Uh, one bathroom that had a pile of like, there was only one toilet, and it had a pile of paper in the corner. And then a painting of a rat beside it, like, and the rat was saying, oh, this is my home or something. And I was just like, okay, well, I don't want to know what's really in there. I didn't know what the paper was from either. It could be someone's discards, but that was pretty gross. I don't think there was a sink there either. Where are all these places have been no sinks? I've never even ran into them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Unless is there anything hot burning on your mind that you feel the need to address to the world today? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, if you're watching this, thank you for sticking through with my incredible awkwardness. I appreciate it. You did fine. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you.